Summoned by your solicitations to slow down, the speaker submits, starting his soliloquy. Silently, he slumbers, then slowly starts to spin sagas, stories slowly spoken to, so spectators can savour each syllable. Sluggishly, he slurs and slips through slick scripts, slide by slide, ensuring even the slowest slug can slither through the speech. A skilful show of slow speech, so soothing, even snails start to sprint. Suddenly, swift sentences surge, speedily spinning, splendidly sparkling. Speech sprints to a, a swift, spectacular sprint. No. No, no. The temptation is strong, but I will obey. Here we go with Chapter 3. Chapter 3. The Creation of Man. A Response. I believe in the literalness of the scriptures, but I believe in their unity as a whole, and often something that is presented in one part of the scripture takes the whole of scripture to understand. I hold the view that Genesis is more than a creation account. It speaks a restoration and hints at something that preceded it. This view is mine, and you are not required to embrace it. However, for context, it does help to revisit some of the details in the beginning of chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. What we see in Genesis 1 is that God created the heavens and the earth. It does not say that he created darkness. Darkness throughout scripture signifies judgment. It just says, darkness was upon the face of the deep. Then the next thing God did was to say, let there be light. This could be viewed as a response on God's part. What was this darkness? Both Paul and John cast the darkness in creation in a negative light and correlate it with ignorance and evil. John refers to it in his more mystical beginning of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were created through him, not apart from him. Not one thing that was made was made without him. Then he adds, In him was life, and the life was the light of man. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness didn't overcome it. In one sense, John is reminding us of the creation account to show that Christ is the reality. This is a picture, but Christ is the reality. God did create the heavens and the earth. There was darkness, and he commanded light. But that speaking was his word, and that word is a person which is Christ. He is the light, and in him is life. John also refers to the word of life, which was in the beginning in 1 John, speaking of Christ as the manifestation of God as light and life, before he talks about darkness, which he associates with the antichrists, those who have taken the way of Cain, who deny they have sin and who have no truth in them. They abide in death. John associates darkness with death and light with life in both his gospel and his epistle. Life that cannot be held by death and cannot be overcome by darkness is resurrection. Paul also speaks of God calling light out of darkness in 2 Corinthians 4, saying that just as God called the light out of darkness, he has shone in our hearts to illuminate the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In contrast, those who are veiled are blinded by the God of this world, so they cannot behold the glory of God. John and Paul both teach that the present world abides in darkness. The Hebrew word used in Genesis 1, 2, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, is haya, which can be translated as was, became, or came to be. Therefore the phrase, the earth was without form and void, can also be understood as the earth became without form and void. The reason the light comes out is so that life can come. The focus in Genesis 1 is life. Light comes for life. But when the earth became formless and void, it denotes chaos and destruction, a result of God's judgment. The Hebrew words for formless and void are tohu and bohu. We find they only appear a few times and are always linked to chaos and destruction resulting from God's judgment. I believe the earth became formless and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Now look at God's response. He said, Let there be light. And there was light. In the beginning the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. 
The same was in the beginning with God. All things were created through him, not apart from him. Not one thing that was made was made without him. Then he adds, In him was life, and the life was the light of man. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness didn't overcome it. In one sense, John is reminding us of the creation account to show that Christ is the reality. This is a picture, but Christ is the reality. God did create the heavens and the earth. There was darkness, and he commanded light. But that speaking was his word, and that word is a person, which is Christ. He is the light, and in him is life. John also refers to the word of life, which was in the beginning in 1 John, speaking of Christ as the manifestation of God as light and life, before he talks about darkness, which he associates with the Antichrists, those who have taken the way of Cain, who deny they have sin, and who have no truth in them. They abide in death. John associates darkness with death and light with life in both his gospel and his epistle. Life that cannot be held by death and cannot be overcome by darkness is resurrection. Paul also speaks of God calling light out of darkness in 2 Corinthians 4, saying that just as God called the light out of darkness, he has shone in our hearts to illuminate the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In contrast, those who are veiled are blinded by the God of this world, so they cannot behold the glory of God. John and Paul both teach that the present world abides in darkness. The reason the light comes out is so that life can come. The focus in Genesis 1 is life. Light comes for life. But when the earth became formless and void, it denotes chaos and destruction, a result of God's judgment. The Hebrew words for formless and void are tohu and bohu. We find they only appear a few times and are always linked to chaos and destruction resulting from God's judgment. God said in Isaiah 45, 18, that he did not create the earth formless and void, but to be inhabited. This suggests to me that if I'm going to be consistent with the entirety of Scripture, and he says he didn't create it that way, then it's more likely that something happened between when God created the heavens and the earth and when it became formless and void. He didn't create it formless and void. He created it to be inhabited. So what happened? Why was there darkness on the face of the deep? The Hebrew word for deep is teom. It can also be translated as abyss, ocean or flood. Where did the deep come from? The deep in scripture is the abyss, the dwelling place of demons and fallen angels. Darkness and judgment. Darkness, consistently throughout scripture, signifies judgment. Water can symbolize either judgment or life, depending on the context. The flood of Noah is a reference to the waters of judgment. So there was darkness, meaning there was no light, and there were waters, an abyss. This is the basic premise of the gap theory, that there was a gap of time implied between Genesis 1, 1, 2, which represents a fall of a previous order, the fall of angels, and a subsequent judgment. While we are concerned with the biblical account of God's testimony concerning his Son, it is worth noting that there is a parallel occult history that inverts these events and treats the darkness in Genesis 1, 2 as positive, and the responses of God to the darkness to shape and create order as negative and even evil. Now, whether you want to believe in what is called the gap theory is up to you. This is how I view it. It is said that G.H. Pember popularised the gap theory in his book Earth's Earliest Ages. Although I have attempted to read it in the past, I cannot recall much of it. However, I do remember that he argued for the existence of a pre-Adamic humanoid race. While I was introduced to this idea at some point, my understanding of it is mainly based on biblical accounts related Lucifer's fall. In Ezekiel 28, 13, 14, it is mentioned that Lucifer once walked upon the stones of fire in an Eden-like setting. But due to his numerous transgressions and greed, he was discovered to be iniquitous and was cast out from the holy mountain. The question that arises is, when did Satan rebel? Was it after or before the fall of man? We know that when Adam and Eve were in the garden, there was already a negative element represented by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. 
Death was present, sin was there, and Lucifer, who had already fallen, was a serpent. He was the Narkash, the Shining One, the Enchanter. He had already lied and sinned. He was sinning while he was lying to them, introducing them to death and sin. God warned them about death and sin. Many people may think that the beginning of everything was perfect and without death, but scriptural evidence suggests otherwise. The darkness that covered the earth and the presence of an abyss indicates that some sort of judgment or catastrophic event had already taken place. These negative aspects are related to Satan's kingdom and God's judgment, the angelic perspective. From Satan's perspective, although God desired to have man before the foundation of the world, man would have been perceived as a response to Satan's rebellion and displacement. Satan viewed himself as having authority over this world, being called the God of this world. Do you remember when he promised the kingdoms of the world to Jesus Christ? Was this an idle boast? But was it really his? Not originally. God gave it to man who he created from the dust of the earth. God made man in his likeness and gave him dominion. This was an insult to the angels. The angels questioned God's decision. They wondered why God was mindful of man, who was made lower than the angels, yet was given dominion over all God's works. Psalm 8, 3, 6 When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars, which thou hast ordained. 4. What is man that thou art mindful of him? and the Son of Man, that thou visitest him. 5. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honour. 6. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. According to Hebrews 2, this was an angel that spoke this. To them it was a wonderful mystery. To some it was an insult. God has always worked on the principle, as stated in Corinthians, of choosing the foolish things of this world, the things which are despised, to confound the mighty and the strong. The angels were the first group to be offended by God's choice of foolish things. So-called foolish man will be instrumental in displacing Satan not only from the earth, but the heavens as well. Currently, Satan can go back and forth, accusing us before God. But this will come to an end when he is displaced even in the heavens by the man-child who has been given dominion. The redeemed, regenerated, transformed, glorified, heavenly new creation man will occupy the highest place of honour. When you really start digging into it, in his eyes, we have become his replacement. We are given more than any angel because we are brought into God's heart and made one with him. This is represented in Genesis 1, even though it is the earthly foreshadow by the tree of life, which is God's life presented to man as food. I understand that not everyone agrees with this view. For the record, I still believe in a seven-day creation model. However, there are even some mysteries to the seven days, if we are literal enough with the scriptures. For example, the sun and the stars were set in place on the fourth day to set times and seasons. We know a 24-hour period is dictated by the Earth's rotation with respect to the Sun, but the Sun and the stars were not put into their place to govern times and seasons until the fourth day. So, what governed the times and seasons for the first three days? Furthermore, the seventh day never ended. We are taught in Hebrews that this seventh day, which represents God's rest, is always held forth as today, whether in Joshua's time, David's time, or now. Well, darkness and light, I suppose. I don't know. I don't have all the answers. I just wanted to let you know where I stand on this. After the judgment of the angels, or whatever this former cataclysm was, the earth was plunged into darkness. Peter mentions that the earth, which was then destroyed, was standing in and out of the water. He then talks about the earth that presently is. It's kind of strange. These are some mysterious things that come from trying to be as literal as possible when reading the word. Spiritual overtones. Regardless of whether or not you agree with my interpretation of Genesis as a restoration account following a previous judgment, the main idea is that we can see a pattern where darkness is present, then the spirit moves and God does something. 
As we will see, much of what God does from Genesis 1 through 12 is related to separation. He separates light from darkness and dry ground from the sea, setting boundaries for the sea. He separates the people in what we will call the line of life from the people of the world in Cain's line, and separates Noah from the old world through the ark, and later separates the people of Shem's line by language from the people of that world. And as believers today, our hearts, which were once filled with darkness and alienation, become enlightened with the knowledge of Jesus Christ when God speaks the gospel and shines his light into our lives. This shining continues to distinguish and separate truth from error, darkness from light, the soul and the spirit, the earthly and the heavenly, the wisdom of God from the demonic wisdom from below. In Genesis 1, in the midst of the darkness, the spirit broods. The Hebrew word depicts brooding like a mother hen over eggs to incubate them for life. Remember Jesus weeping over Jerusalem and saying how long he had longed to gather them as a chick gathers her hens. Here the Spirit is portrayed in the same way, hovering over the waters of the deep. God calls light out of the darkness, and Paul says that this is how God works with us. Our hearts were in darkness. We didn't understand Jesus Christ at all. We didn't understand God's glory. We couldn't even see him. He was just a historical figure that we discarded and mocked. That was my life. My heart was in darkness, but the Spirit was hovering over me. There were so many people in my life, Christians, that I persecuted and caused to suffer. God responded through those praying for me. What was that? That was the Spirit hovering over me through the church. Eventually he incubated a softness in me that allowed for life and light to come forth. God shined, he called light out of darkness and shined in my heart to illuminate the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Suddenly Jesus Christ was three-dimensional in my view. He was risen, he was real in my mind. I couldn't stop dealing with him. I had to contend with him and that changed my life and caused me to be born of God. When the light comes, life comes, and that was my eating of the tree of life. He made himself available to me as a kind of food, and ever since then he's been supplying me with himself as life and light. And that's true of all of us as believers. And we must remember that just because Paul and John use an allegorical spiritual approach, it does not void the literal. This is a literal creation account. God literally created the heavens and the earth in seven days. I don't believe that the universe is super old or anything like that. I'm as literal as possible with the Bible. But I do believe that those first three days, there may have been more that happened than what the story portrays. Remember, we are looking at this history through the lens of what God wants to tell us about his testimony concerning his son. Remember... Time is a physical property that bends and changes. It moves at different rates depending on your place in it. It's even impacted by things like mass and gravity and acceleration. But that's not the point. The point is not the cosmology. The point is the principle. For anything to happen when there's judgment, darkness, water and death, God responds next with light and life. On the third day he brings forth dry ground where life can grow. God calls forth light by speaking, and by his speaking, he separates the darkness from the light. Separation The principle of separation is evident in the first three days of creation. Through his spoken word, God separated darkness from light, heaven from earth, and dry land from water. This same kind of separation is necessary in our lives. God separates soul from spirit, the spirit of fear from the spirit of sonship, the clean from the unclean, and the old from the new. When we are saved and the knowledge of God's glory is revealed to us through Jesus Christ, a process of separation begins. God separates us from our former life by baptizing us into the death of Christ. He separates us from false teachings by washing us with his word. This process of separation is ongoing in our lives. The word is a two-edged sword. It is meant to divide. Hebrew says that the word is living, sharp and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide asunder soul and spirit and pierce even to the thoughts and intention of the heart. He searches us. The word is a person who searches us. 
Nothing is hidden from the eyes of him with whom we have to do. This is another reason why the doctrine is strewn through the Bible. On the one hand, you're searching the word. On the other hand, the word is searching you. Ah, this searching is for you to discern what's of the old and what's of the new, and is a critical aspect of our spiritual journey. There needs to be a separation. One of the reasons why Christians don't learn and grow is because they don't have that foundational understanding that separation is a good thing. Division is a good thing. Division is of God. Often it is said that there's unity in the body and so therefore we all need to be one. However, the unity of the body is enjoyed in fellowship, which is a group of people who have been separated out by the word and divided from all the darkness. Remember what Paul said to Timothy. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honour and some to dishonour. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honour, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Separated individuals become vessels of honour, who can discern the difference between the earth and the heavens, natural things and spiritual things. They have a fellowship that can build up the body of Christ. The oneness is a separated out oneness, not a general one. It's not unity for the sake of unity. Keeping the peace and letting darkness and light, heaven and earth, water and dry, all peacefully coexist, is not the way. The word comes, and when the light comes and when life comes, there's a separation. The dry land eventually is separated. If you want life to grow and the herbs and the grass and everything to start coming forth and generating fruit, you've got to be separate. This doesn't mean not watching TV or not dancing or not wearing pants. It is a separation of being renewed in the spirit of your mind by the entrance of his word, which gives light. The entrance of the word is light and gives understanding, and that understanding changes the course of our lives. We are going towards the new city of Jerusalem, moving steadfastly towards Christ. It may not seem like it sometimes, and if it's up to us, we might veer in another direction. But we've been given a faithful shepherd who will not lose any of us and will bring us home to glory. And meanwhile, he is providing everything necessary for us to grow in all things into him, and that's his life growing in us. This is what it means to partake in his life. We are increasingly being moulded into him, and he is fitting himself into us as he nourishes us with himself as the tree of life. 